Hello and welcome to Darknet Demystified. This is our first podcast, first episode. Um, I created this podcast because I had a ton of people who asked for it, so I figured I might as well make it. My name's Sam Bent. My alias online was Two Happy Times 2, and Killaby and a bunch of other aliases too. I was a previous Darknet vendor, a market admin, paralegal, an author, a hacker, a nerd, a pirate, and a gorist, and among many other things that I call myself and other people tend to call me. <laughs> In this podcast, I'm going to be discussing a ton of different stuff, like the dark net, operational security, and other kind of random and interesting tidbits of information that I find and learn about as time goes on. And I hope that you'll be there on that journey with me. Today, some of the topics that I'm going to be covering are address poisoning, I2P's new update, and lastly, we'll be talking about how Larry Harmon, um, who's the creator of uh, Grams, which is a dark web search engine, and Helix, which is a Bitcoin tumbler, which is completely useless, basically. Um, his brother ended up stealing a bunch of Bitcoin, which we'll, we'll get into last. Now, that said, I'm pretty excited to be doing this podcast. It's the first episode. I'm going to be posting this first and foremost on YouTube, on my channel that's on there, which is called Doing Fed Time, all one word. Majority of the stuff on there is stuff that relates to you know, cryptocurrencies, mainly dark net markets, and federal prison which is, I know, super eclectic mix of different things, but that's what's there. If when you're listening to this podcast, you're like, oh, it's, you know, the, the audio is not perfect, and, you know, it kind of jumps around, you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, it's literally just me producing this, and at the same time that I'm producing this, I'm also making YouTube videos and writing books and, you know, doing a regular nine-to-five job and, so, like, you know, it's definitely a ton of stuff. And, you know, if you guys have any constructive criticism, I'm definitely open to it. I'm always looking to improve. But that said, let's get on with the main event, which is going to be, you know, the topics that we're covering today. This first episode is going to be super short just because I'm dipping my toes into the water and, you know, getting familiar with the software that I'm using and all that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate you guys and I'm muscling through it with me and, uh, you know, giving me any feedback that you might find, find to be helpful or insightful. I'm definitely open to hearing from you guys. All of my social media contact information is right there on YouTube. I'm also on Twitter at doingfedtime.com. So with all that said, let's get into the actual news. There's a company called MetaMask, which is basically a crypto wallet provider that's, you know, warning its users of a new scam that's called address poisoning. This basically tricks users into sending funds to a scammer instead of the, like, the intended person that they want it to be sent to. The scam works basically by poisoning the wallet's transaction history with that person or that scammer's address that look similar to the address of the person who's going to get scammed's recent transactions. So to prevent this, basically that company MetaMask recommends that users be diligent when copying addresses and to make use of their built-in address book feature to save known or valid addresses. They also suggest searching for a known valid transaction and grabbing the full address from the blockchain explorer like Etherscan. Uh, however, as Ethereum addresses are very long, it may cause some issues in the user interface design. This is a lot like, you know, when we see a dark net, you know, go down or we see someone who loses their bookmarks or we see someone who, you know, installs the Tor browser and they don't have any bookmarks or they didn't export them and save them or they're on a new system or whatever, and they kind of just like 
hop on Reddit and find a random user who's like, oh, hey, you know, XYZ market, here's the dot onion for it. And they just kind of randomly go to that, you know, URL and they get fished. Um, I think like, you know, we see a lot of throughout the history of cybersecurity, we've seen a lot of those kind of things where it's like an old scam that's just renewed and refreshed and put into a new kind of context, which, you know, then it, it works, you know, it, it works. Like if you have you know, the reason why a lot of scammers use these old kind of scams is because at the end of the day, they're predictable and they work. And that's just, it's something that's, that's interesting to see. Like when I had originally checked out the article on address poisoning, you know, I'm thinking, you know, like art poisoning, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking something way kind of cooler, I guess. <laughs> like, um, I didn't think it was going to be this lame, but it was, yeah, it is pretty lame. It's basically like, you know, don't get fished, uh, you know, smarten up. So that was, that was definitely interesting. I think a lot of us out there, um, you know, kind of look forward to updates. I remember back when I used to run Backtrack, um, which is like the predecessor to Kali Linux, which is a hacking operating system. I would love seeing the updates that came through, seeing the version, the new version numbers, or, you know, if you got really lucky, the new software that, you know, was created that, that you were grabbing, um, that was fresh out. I always like seeing those those kind of updates because I knew that it was going to enable me to do more kind of stuff. Like uh, George Washington said that, you know, I've totally just kind of off the top of the head. Um, so if I screw this quote up, just know <laughs> just know that it's this is not verbatim. Um, that at the end of the day, if he had four hours to cut down a cherry tree, he would spend the first three sharpening his blade basically speaking to, you know, being prepared and being, being ready. And, you know, the great thing about that kind of thing is that at the end of the day with us nowadays, with things like, you know, updates on various things, a lot of the times it gives us additional functionality or makes things a little bit smoother, you know, and I think, uh, this latest update of I2P easy install bundle, which is like version 2.1.0, I think. Uh, basically includes updates to the I2P router, which improves things like performance, connectivity, and secures, you know, long-term health of the I2P network in general. Uh, the release also includes improvements to the browser profile launcher, compatibility with the Tor browser bundle, and updates to Firefox profile and extensions, and updates throughout the code base and deployment process in general. However, users are advised to verify the checksum of the installer before using it, as the release is an unsigned EXE installer, but the updates are signed and safe. And, you know, more details, you can go to I2P's blog at getI2P.net. Talking about you know, I2P, uh, one thing I did want to point out is that I actually have on that YouTube channel a new video coming out that is all about the differences between Tor and I2P. The following for Tor is massive uh, in comparison to I2P, but the structure of both of them, whether you're talking about, you know, how things are routed, where like, uh, you know, Tor uses onion routing and I2P uses garlic routing, like the structure and how everything kind of is between the two when you compare them is in, it's really interesting because there are a lot of differences between the two. And, you know, the, the video that will be coming out either today or tomorrow on my YouTube channel will point out those differences and it's meant to encompass like every difference that I could possibly think of or find when comparing the two it's meant to be you know pretty verbose and detailed um that said obviously i'm not perfect I'm, i probably missed a whole bunch of them if i did go ahead and yell at me uh in the comment section in that video and uh you know i'll definitely make an amended version at some point uh but that said that video is definitely worth checking out and 
learning about IGP as I've kind of taken this journey where, you know, we're seeing the Tor browser and Tor in general, the Tor project kind of get hammered by DDoS and DOS attacks where, you know, it's getting to a point where a lot of the sites just aren't usable, uh, which is really, really, really sad and unfortunate. But you have this natural evolutionary shift where at the end of the day, when one technology doesn't work, we're going to evolve, you know, um, as a species, we naturally evolve. But as people that, you know, want to be able to have freedom, we have a lot of different options. You know, there are actually a lot of different dark nets that are out there. Tor is not the only network or, you know, overlay network that has a dark net. Um, you know, IGP does too. And that's why, you know, irregardless of what we think about the website, uh, you know, the Alpha Bay admin, uh, for example, um, his name's eluding me right now, but, um, which is not a bad thing. It's a great thing, you know, kind of a, a side topic is, uh, at the end of the day, you know, dealing with a guy who, you know, has a horrible memory. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really remember names all that well. It's great uh, for any co-conspirators that I have. <laughs> um, so that said, uh, he had advised, you know, the use of I2P, uh, the current Alphabet Darknet uh, admin. And I think that's, you know, very interesting. And it's very telling that we might be looking at this paradigm shift where a lot of the darknet users that use the the darknet on tour are going to start evolving and maybe switching over to something like i2p um which would be really interesting and i think might actually be better uh, at the end of the day because i2p from my understanding is a lot better at things like you know keeping a server secure and there's a little bit less latency because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and in order to do some of the attacks that we see in Tor all the time, um, you have to compromise like twice as many nodes or, you know, they call them routers in I2P that you would need to in Tor, which again, that's pretty awesome. Um, that added security and like you know with tor they have like a centralized list of nodes uh, or, or directory centralized directory i'm sorry and you know with igp it's all decentralized so i think there's a lot more resiliency in that network uh, as well as you know less latency and i think that might be where you know the, the kind of the dark net community might be headed uh, over a long period of time again i'm not you know i'm not an expert i was just a i was a dark net vendor and a dark net market admin um, but I'm definitely not like one of these high-end IT super dudes who like, you know, they're studying assembly and, and, you know, they're writing, you know, their own patches for, you know, BSD and it's just definitely not me. Um, but that said, um, the last story that we had to cover is basically about a guy from Ohio and, you know, I want to story start like that. Uh, named Gary James Harmond. And, you know, this guy pled guilty to stealing cryptocurrency by accessing and taking over 712 Bitcoin from a hardware wallet that was seized from his brother, who's Larry Dean Harmond, uh, by the feds. So, like the, you know, the feds go and they seize this wallet and they have the wallet and, you know, this guy Gary... Uh, go ahead and, you know, he goes and accesses it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Larry was the creator and administrator of the now down and dead Graham's uh, dark web search engine, which you could basically put in like, you know, cocaine and it would search every dark net market, you know, for that specific keyword. So you could do it with vendors, you could do it with any kind of stuff. Um, and it would instantly search all these different sites and kind of bring you back very specific and detailed information or show you listings uh, for that particular product or dark net vendor or group or whatever it is that you were looking for. Um, and Helix. And Helix was like a Bitcoin tumbler that ran from uh, 2014 to 2017. 
uh, which, you know, in my opinion is, is a total waste of time. It's total trash. Um, like at the end of the day, laundering money by using a Bitcoin tumbler is, is moronic at best. Um, it was a really, really big thing, uh, when I was a darknet vendor and a darknet market admin, I just never really saw the appeal to it. Um, I actually have on my left wrist, I have a Monroe symbol and a Bitcoin symbol tattooed onto my wrist. Um, and you know, a bunch of other kind of, you know, tattoos that are like that. But those, those tattoos are basically the symbol of like, you know, money laundering. Like, you know, if you have Bitcoin or you're doing something illegal with Bitcoin, swapping it out into Monero and swapping it back is pretty much the equivalent of like robbing a bank, taking the money you get from the bank, buying, you know, a bunch of weed, selling that weed for cash. And now the cash that you have has totally different serial numbers than the cash that you got from the bank. You know, it's like cleaning your money. And, you know, at the same time, selling that weed, you might actually net a profit. Um, so, you know, switching, switching obviously from one crypto to another, you're not really going to net a profit. But my point is, at the end of the day, the small fee that they're going to charge you to switch from one currency to another is nothing in comparison to like, you know, with these crooks who, you know, run Bitcoin tumblers charge. And the fact that, you know, actually verifying that they're doing their job is a whole nother thing. Like you're going to have to actually do blockchain analysis to figure out if, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And to me, like me requiring that level of investigation when I'm, when I was doing the amount of stuff that I was doing just was not worth it to me to have to invest that amount of time and try to figure out to make sure that like a Bitcoin tumbler was actually doing their job when the fee they were charging was asinine to begin with. I just wouldn't pay it. So, and you know, people are like, oh, you're cheap. Well, at the end of the day, if I switch it from, if I switch my crypto from Bitcoin to, you know, XMR, I know for a fact that it's switched. I don't have to confirm that. I don't have to do blockchain analysis. Like the most dangerous thing in an operation is, you know, not knowing a particular thing. So like, you know, if you're basing your operational security on, you know, doing a particular thing or operating in a certain way, and at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to happen at a certain time frame. There's a million different things that can go wrong in even a, a minute time span. So an unknown is an absolute red flag when you're talking about operational security. Um, and because I didn't know, it was a red flag to me and I avoided it. Um, so anyways, back to the thing in hand. So uh, Harmon was arrested in uh, June of 21 and he pled guilty on January 6th of 23. He agreed to foreclose assets, including more than 647.41 Bitcoin. 2.14 Ethereum and 17 million 404,400.64 Dogecoin. He'll be sentenced on March 17th, 2023. His brother Larry Harmon pleaded guilty to money laundering charges in August 2021. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these dudes, the, the really the big downfall um, of a lot of these guys is that you end up, you know, seeing these dudes cooperate with law enforcement, um, which, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate at the end of the day that they do that. Like, you know, you end up putting other people in prison because, you know, a lot of times they're scared to go to prison. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's like the, you know, for anyone who's ever looked at kind of like the Salem witch trials, I think our justice system operates in very much the same fashion where it's like one person gets in trouble and that person, you know, kind of because their own cowardice um, freaks out and ends up, you know, bringing five or six other people with them. It's like if I'm drowning and I grab you and I push you under the water to lift myself up to get a breath of fresh air for a minute. And, you know, I just keep pushing you under every time you try to come up. Like, that's exactly what we do. But, you know, we have people who do that to six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 people, 20 people, you know, at a shot. And 
it's just really i'm not saying that like at the end of the day this guy actually did that because i don't know i'd have to you know in order to know someone's you know telling on someone you're gonna have to hop on pacer and and look them up and and read their paperwork and see if there's anything like you know um rule 35 b's which is when someone snitches after they've been convicted um or if there's anything like uh you know 5k1 you know 5k1.1 letters which are you know basically it's the statute that gives people downward departures or less time for cooperating with law enforcement so i'm not sure whether he did it or not but it's just unfortunate that so many people in the darknet community tend to you know assist the feds because you know the feds are basically morons when it comes to the dark net from my experience anyway um i just i i've you know to me they take the easy way out when you have people that you know snitch it's not really investigations it's like you're being given the answers like your job is to figure stuff out and at the end of the day if you don't figure that stuff out then you're being told what the answer is you know it's like is a mathematician a mathematician if they use a calculator right um i just i always thought that was kind of an interesting parallel to look at and kind of evaluate it with um in any case i know this first episode has been super short um i'd love to hear you guys' feedback in terms of what you like what you didn't like uh how i can improve definitely let me know um, in the comments section again this it's going to go on YouTube first, and then depending on how that goes, I might, you know, put it elsewhere. But thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode.